Okay, we're going to go on the air in a moment. So from now until I turn it off, please don't say anything that will embarrass you in front of your grandchildren. <laughs> um, okay, <laughs> terrific to see everybody here. Um, this is the highlight of my year always. I get to uh, teach in the uh, teach the fellow of the Sarmad Midrash and also get to really teach at a high level to the community. So thank you all very much for coming out. The, um, okay, the, the title of this series is What Does Beit Din Do? And it struck me that probably most people in the community have really no idea um, what, a Beit, what a Beit Din does, uh, which is unfortunate because the institution of a Beit Din is really important uh, for a community. Uh, for the construction of a halachic community that takes law seriously. Uh, so what I'm going to do tonight is talk about one area that is probably the primary area of the Beit Din in Boston's function, which is how we handle divorce. I'm going to do this as a two-part series. Tonight I'm going to talk about theory. Um, right? what, is, what, is, what is the purpose of the way in which we structure halachic divorce? What were, the, what were the rabbi's aims in setting up a divorce system and perhaps somewhat, what does Beit Din, uh, right, what role does the existence of a court play in that? And then next week we'll do it more as a practicum. Right? This is how a divorce functions, these are the usual cases, this is, these are the unusual cases, how do we handle them? Okay, so we're going to start from the right, source number one, which is the biblical verse, which is essentially all the content that the Torah gives us about divorce. Uh, what matters to us is that what the Torah sets up as a divorce process is the chatavla sefer kritut v'natan biada, that the husband writes a bill of divorce and gives it into the hand of the wife. So what I want to set out a thesis, uh, which I think is very important for understanding the way in which Chazal understood this process, what, right, that they noticed two things. A, it has to be on paper. And B, that piece of paper has to be delivered directly to the wife. And that was the, that was, that was the premise that they began with. There had to be something significant. Now, I hypothesized uh, several months ago, and it turns out as a uh, sort of a gamble, at, um, as a shear, but it turned out to be true, that um, the requirement of a document is unique in the ancient Near East. Um, this, is a, right, this is a unique feature of biblical law as opposed to ancient Near Eastern divorce law, that we require a document which is handed to the woman. This has been confirmed by Professor Shalom Holtz uh, of Yeshiva University, and by the way, also an alumnus of the Sarah Baby Raj. Um, so I want to set out a particular thesis as to what the rabbis, uh, the rabbis got from this. Which is that they said that the, the under, what they understood from the requirement that there be a document which ends up in the hand of the woman, that the purpose of the document was to be a receipt. And that meant that you had to end up, um, you had to end up that not only was the divorce effective, but that the woman could prove that she was divorced. Okay, and that was the, right, and that I think is one of the, the animating principles of the rabbinic conception of divorce. You have to set the system up in such a way that a, right, that, the, that divorce does not happen without proof, and proof also allows you, of course, right, uh, it comes with it privileges, it allows you the privilege of remarriage, and it also allows you the privilege of collecting your ketubah. Okay. The, um, okay, now you'll notice that the court, that the, that the pasuk does not mention anything about a court. If you read the Pasuk, it simply says that divorce happens by the man writing a receipt and handing it to the woman. So what I'm going to hypothesize is that a large part of the purpose of the court is to ensure that the receipt which is delivered is effective as proof. And really a large part of the purpose of the Beit Din is to make sure that when the husband writes the divorce and hands it to the woman, since the, it is unlikely that either of them are profound experts in the law of divorce. So we make sure that the procedure always takes place through the medium of a court to ensure that the document as delivered to the woman is in fact valid and that neither of them is under the misapprehension that they are divorced when they are not. The consequences of that misapprehension, however, because of the, uh, the, um, the, the um, biblical permission of polygamy but the ban on polygyny, uh, not poly polyandry, the ban on polyandry, uh, and because of the consequences of Mamzerut, 
Um, so it, it ends up being much more important for the woman to have proof than the man, so the, right, so the woman ends up with the document. Okay, I'm going to propose um, an analogy to try and understand a lot of the ways in which these are set up, which is to medical tests. So when you're setting up a, when you're, when you're designing medical tests, you're trying to go for what are called accuracy and sensitivity, meaning that you want to make sure that if your test, that if your test shows that something happened, that it really did happen. And secondly, you want to make sure that if it tells you something didn't happen, that matters. That it didn't just miss a lot of the things you're looking for. And right? whether things are looking for are good things, bad things, whatever it is. Right? Those are, so you want to avoid false positives, and you want to avoid false negatives. In this case, what we mean by a false positive is we want to avoid the, uh, the impression on, be, on behalf of either the woman or the Beit Din that she is divorced when she's not. That's a false positive. Or that she's not divorced when she is, which is a false negative. Okay, I'm going to set out further that the rabbis actually have a um, have two other categories aside from the false positive and the false negative that they wish to avoid. One of them we'll call the unfortunate negative. The unfortunate negative is a woman who is not divorced but ought to be. Okay, and we'll talk about what the reasons are that we might determine that this is not a relationship which should continue, and therefore, right, therefore we're, go right, we're going to try and see if there are ways in which we can prevent a woman from remaining married when she ought not to be. Um, and then there are also two circumstances which we'll call unprovable and, and unresolved, which don't, the difference between us doesn't matter very much, is that we don't ever want somebody to be in a situation where nobody can tell. It's not that anyone has a false impression. They just can't tell whether they're married or not. Right? We should never allow a circumstance like that. So you want to make sure that there's certainty, that the certainty is true, and there are specific circumstances where we want to make sure that the truth is a particular way. Okay, so let's what we're going to try and show is that the rabbis try to set up default mechanisms that enable this. And in circumstances where, the, where it's not so easy to do this by default mechanisms, they come up with um, what we might call dramatic and daring constructions of, um, constructions of legal tradition that enable them to assure these outcomes. Okay, so let's take a look at, um, at source number two. Okay, source number two is not about divorce. It's about, it's, right, it's about death of the husband, but we'll see in source number three that the same principle which, uh, which we set out in number two will apply in number three. So the other circumstance, aside from divorce for this matter, is, is widowhood. You don't want people to believe that, they are, <coughs> that, they, uh, that their husband is dead when he's not. I don't want them to falsely believe that they can't remarry because their, their husband is alive when he's not. So the problem is that, regrettably, the way the world is set up, um, people don't always die in the most legally convenient fashion. Um, right? and really, what should happen is right, we should set up a formal legal requirement that any married man who dies should only be allowed to die in the presence of two valid male unrelated Shomer Shabbos witnesses. <laughs> All right, and that way we would never have to worry about a, uh, about a, about a, about a, lack, of about a lack of certainty. Um, and, but reality doesn't always work that way. I should say that's one of the great uh, heroism, tragic heroism stories that we have of Halakhic Judaism of the 21st century was in the, in the 20th century, was that at 9-11, there were, um, there were husbands who went out of their way to make sure that their wives could establish their presence in the building by making cell phone calls, getting the rabbi on the line, right, having, having other people testify that it was their voice on the line and ensuring that way that their wives would not, uh, would not become ugly. Um, but I mean, those are extraordinary circumstances. Generally, people are not quite as um, in control of their circumstances. So the question is, What's supposed to happen? Um, what's supposed to happen halachically? So the Mishnah uh, sets up the Mishnah sets up a series of interesting cases like that. But we'll set up the, the basic cases. You have a married couple that is living apart. For they are in different countries. Right, a woman whose husband has gone to the the the, uh, the land of the sea. So I had fun in English translating that as Atlantis. Uh, because the truth is, we just don't know where Medina Hayam is. Uh, and it, the term doesn't show up elsewhere in rabbinic literature, so it might as well be Atlantis. It's somewhere, right, it's somewhere outside, somewhere outside the normal, uh, the normal boundaries of the Jewish community. 
Okay, so the, the halakha, as it initially set up, seems like a very um, draconian law. It says that if a woman's husband has traveled abroad, and then she gets word that, uh, that her husband has died, and she remar remarries on the basis of that word, um, and then it turns out that her husband actually comes back. We're not in the return of Martin Garrett situation. It really is her husband. We're sure it really is her husband, so there's no, there's no doubt. So she is required to divorce her old, to divorce her, um, her original husband, to divorce her new husband, the kids of Amzerim, and then we have a whole long Mishnah t telling all the horrible consequences that occur as a result. Okay. Um, but it also, right, the Mishnah also ends up um, setting up two different categories of the ones remarried. One is where she remarries with the permission of the court, and the other is where she remarries without the permission of the court. And ironically, the consequences are worse if she marries with permission, with the, under the authority, I should say, better than with permission. She marries birishut beitin under the authority of the court, then all these terrible consequences happen. But if she marries not under the authority of the court, then we just treat her as somebody who committed a right, who committed an offense unwittingly, which should mean that um, that she can go back to the first uh, to the to the original husband. So why should that be? So, it, so the Talmud interprets this to mean that it doesn't mean that in one case she got married against the will of Beit Din, and in the other case she got married in accordance with the will of Beit Din, because that would be paradoxical. Why should you suffer more for, accept, right, for accepting the will of Beit Din? Instead, the rabbi said that to be married under the authority of Beit Din is to mean that you're married in a circumstance where it is only the authority of Beit Din that would allow you to marry. Meaning that if you have evidence that is convincing under ordinary law that your husband is dead, you don't need to ask a Beit Din to remarry. You know the truth, right? Your husband is dead. So what's the right? So if you had two valid witnesses that the husband is dead, you don't need a Psak. So that's getting married not under the authority of Beit Din. That's getting married under the authority of your own reasonable expectation, uh, re reasonable, reasonable, justified belief that your husband is dead. But, the rabbi said, if you have evidence that would normally not be legally significant, you only have one witness, you have an invalid witness, you have circumstantial evidence. So under those circumstances, you would not be allowed to marry without a psak of the Beit Din. But, a Beit Din is authorized to release you to remarry nonetheless. So we essentially, we essentially abandon all standard evidentiary all, all, the, all the usual evidentiary standards in the case of demonstrating death. Now, why should that be? So I want to contend, and the answer is, because otherwise, you'd have, right, you'd have lots and lots of women who would be stuck in a circumstance where they could not know whether they were married or not, because people don't die in front of witnesses always. So the rabbis assumed there had to be a solution Right? We can't allow reality to trap us that way. So they, say, right, so they said that we're going to relax the rules of evidence and we allow essentially any form of evidence that we find reasonably compelling to release women, um, who, uh, to release women who would otherwise be, um, right, be stuck in, uh, in, um, in, a, in, in stasis. So that way, they got rid of a lot of false, of false negatives. Right? There are a lot of women who would believe that they were still married, would believe their husband was not dead, but in fact their husband is dead. The problem they had is that, so now they've gotten rid of all the false negatives, but the cost of that is they're going to generate a whole lot of false positives. Women who believe, they're, right, who believe that, they're, that their husbands are dead when they're not. So the balance they set up is as follows. Now they said, well they, well they, and this is how the text ends. The text says, "Mitoch shchomer shechmar te alei abesofa haikilo alei habitchila." Right. So the right they actually have two framings for it. They say the general principle is that this whole system is a leniency set up for the sake of agunot. That's the whole purpose of the system is to make right is to make sure that women are never trapped in a circumstance where they can't know whether they're married or not. But, 
The risk, right, the risk involved is that there are women who will believe that they are unmarried when in fact they are. So they set up a draconian system of consequences for error. And then they said, aha, and what justifies us in accepting evidence that is ordinarily insufficient? The fact that the consequences of getting it wrong are so great means that, that, means that the woman being willing to marry on the basis of that evidence means that this evidence is more trustworthy than usual evidence of that sort. So they, allowed, right, so they set up the penalties. They, um, they, made the, they contended that the existence of the penalties meant that the evidence itself gained strength, and thereby they tried to establish a system which, both, which, um, which, eliminated essentially, which essentially eliminated false negatives while minimizing the number of false positives that occurred as a result, meaning that all women whose husbands were dead should be able to remarry because we should be able to find some kind of case to establish that. <coughs> but, and nonetheless, we won't even, even, and even though we're lowering the standards of evidence dramatically, we believe that we can do so um, by setting up penalties in a way that will not, um, that will not generate false claims that somebody, um, that somebody is dead. Okay. So with that, I want to turn now to source number three, where we will actually begin to, um, to touch divorce. Um, okay, so now here we have to, here we have to put in a, uh, one, one detail of the law, the way rabbis understood it. So the verse says, V'katav la sefer kritut. He has to write to her a, um, a, a bill of divorce. This is understood halakhically as requiring the bill of divorce to be written with a specific set of intents. Namely, you have to write it with the intent, um, with the intent for this specific man to be divorced, with the intent for this specific woman to be divorced, and for and with the intent that this document be used to effect their divorce. Um, the problem is, whenever you introduce a legal requirement of a state of mind, you now have a, you have a problem. How do you establish that the person actually was thinking that? How do we know that that was in mind? So we have a normal, a normal legal principle in that regard, which is that we require the person to state their intent, and then we have a halachic principle which is dvarim shibalei ve'nam dvarim, which is that, um, that words, uh, word, words in the heart don't count when you have stated something else explicitly. So once you make a statement, I intend this, if you come back to us a week later and say, no, 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 I was joking, <laughs> tough. You said it. So we have a basic, right, we have a simple model for, um, for establishing intent, which is we will make the, we will make the husband at the moment that he just bef at the moment that he writes the document, we will make the husband um, declare, I am writing this document, lishmo, lishma, l'shem gerushin. Now here already you can see the purpose of a court, because really under the law the husband could just do it, could do all this privately, but we need to establish, right? We want, we want to make sure that we can prove it. In order to prove it, the husband has to make a statement in front of witnesses. Like valid witnesses. Okay. But it gets more complicated. Um, because one of the circumstances the rabbis set up, which is parallel to the first case, is the, case, the circumstance in which you might think that divorce is most desirable and necessary are circumstances in which husbands and wives are living apart. Right? If you have a husband who has gone to Midah Hayam and right, has gone to Atlantis and is not coming back, right, that's a reasonable circumstance for us to want to make sure that divorce is at least possible. So the rabbis were, right, and so in recognizing this, the rabbis, the rabbis said that the katabla sefer kritut finatan biada, you can write, you have to, right, he should write a bill of divorce and, hand, and give it into her hand. Meaning that, he, that his agent can give it into her hand, or he can give it into the hand of her agent. And that allows a, doc, right, a bill of divorce to be sent from the husband to the wife, as opposed to be handed from the husband to the wife. We'll talk about how the details of that play out next week, but in principle, the rabbis, all right, the rabbis assumed that the intent of the Torah was not to say that the only way you could be divorced was if you were still proximate, because that seemed counterintuitive. Those are precisely the cases where you don't necessarily need a divorce, but if you're really going to live apart permanently, you shouldn't trap 
Right? You shouldn't trap the woman in practical, thing, right, in practical unmarried state. So now the problem is, how can we establish that the husband actually, right? So now, so now I guess what we have is, what we have now is, a document is going to show up from somewhere else. And that doc, right, and that now the woman has the receipt, and she's, going to, and she's going to have to use that receipt to prove remarriage, but a document cannot demonstrate the intent of the writer. Right? We don't know what the husband meant. So how can we, right, so how can we have the, right, how can we have the, uh, enable the woman to, to gain, how can we enable the law of divorce to fulfill its function, which is that the, the holding of the receipt by the woman is sufficient to allow her to remarry, if we also allow the document to be sent from somewhere else, meaning that the people who are currently judging whether the document is valid have no direct access to the intent and speech of the author. So the rabbi set up a fascinating system. Uh, what they said is that the, agent, that the agent who delivers a divorce under such circumstances is required to declare in front of a court in the, right, in the place of delivery. So the first thing they set up is, right, in such divorces, you cannot do it without a court. Right? Simply, you cannot do it without a court. All divorces that come from abroad have to be delivered in front of a court. And then they said, the process that happens, uh, right, the, way in which the, the way in which the delivery occurs is that the agent comes and the agent makes a statement and he says, this, right, he says, this divorce was written in front of me and signed in front of me. We'll talk next week about whether that's really true when he says it. Right, but, he said, but the agent is required to make the statement, this document was written in front of me and signed in front of me. And the reason for that is that establishes the agent as capable of testifying about the intent of the author. And then we ask the agent, really? So you saw the document being written, do you know that this document was written with proper intent? And the answer is yes. Okay, All right, so then the standard divorce procedure requires that when a, when a divorce is delivered from abroad, it is delivered by an, a, the agent of delivery has to testify that the document was written with proper intent. Okay, but now we have a problem. How many people is the agent? One. We don't normally accept the testimony, right, the testimony of, the testimony of, one, of one witness um, it matters. It matters of personal status. You should require two, all right, two, um, two witnesses. So why is it that we believe the? Right, why is it that we believe the agent? So the answer is that if you required two witnesses, the rabbis tell you that they thought that was that would make divorce too hard. That it was it could be just be so expensive and so impractical to send divorces if you had to pay for two agents. That um, right, but it simply wouldn't happen. So they set up a system in which they said that we absolutely believe the one witness, the one witness, uh, the one witness who comes, even though ordinarily required two witnesses. So just as it turns out that in cases of death, we, right, we relax the we, right, we relax the standard to ensure that the, that the to ensure that the woman isn't trapped in a circumstance where she doesn't know whether her husband is dead. So here too. We relax the standards of proof to ensure that a woman whose husband is permanently abroad um, can be divorced. And then we're worried, okay, so we can let her be divorced, but how can she prove that she's divorced? So we say that we, right, we, say that we allow that, right, we allow lower standards of evidence um, to occur. And we construct a similar argument later, which we don't have to get into now, in which we say that why do we believe him? Well, we believe him because he knows he's going to have to come testify in front of a court, so, it's, right, so he's going to make sure that it's true. Yes. I may have missed something. Yeah. Um, I thought you said before that just delivery of the document is sufficient. And, 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 and that even if he says, well, I didn't really mean it, it still counts. No, if he made a statement. No, no, if, if he delivers a document that, of divorce, yeah. and then later on he says, well, I didn't really mean it. It's no, what I said was that if he makes a statement, I intend this document for divorce, and later he says, I didn't. That right, then we wouldn't listen to him. But if he, but if the document is simply delivered, you have to demonstrate the validity of the document. No, no, but suppose he himself hands it to his wife. Yes. And he says, I, you know, does he have to say something or just hand her the document? Well, we actually formalize it. 
right? In order to avoid any, right? We, the whole system in Beit Din is set up to make sure he can never make any claims. So we make him explicitly state, this so the is your divorce. The document itself is not enough. He actually has to make a, a verdict. But the document itself is enough if it's a valid, should be enough in theory, if it's a valid document. But if he walks up, right, if a man walks over to his wife and hands her, right, and hands her the New York Times. No, no, uh, so you can't put a valid document. But how do we know it? But, you know, but the problem is the, val- the document not, can never... Not, not the agent, the husband. Not yeah, even the husband, the document itself can't prove its own, exist, its own validity because it depends on the state of mind. And the fact that he's giving it doesn't tell you anything about his state of mind when writing it. So he has to make a, a, a separate verbal declaration at the time of the writing. Okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, for instance, we have here is one model right, for the rabbis relaxed standards of evidence. And the reason that they, uh, that they relax they relaxed standards of evidence is to ensure, that the, um, to ensure that women who should be divorced can get divorced. And the women who get divorced can, right, are treated as having absolute proof of the, uh, of the fact of divorce. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at um, source, source number four. So source number four deals with the, deals with the um, reverse, the reverse circumstance, which is we're not talking about where instead of the get being delivered by the husband's agent to the wife, where she is, instead the wife appoints an agent, and that agent goes to the husband and accepts the divorce on her behalf. Okay, now the, the practical difference is that when a husband, that, when, that in either case, the divorce becomes valid when, it's, when the ownership of the document is transferred from the husband to the wife. So when the husband sends an agent, when is it transferred? <coughs> when the agent hands the document to the wife. But when the wife sends an agent, the transfer happens when the agent acquires it. Okay, so here we have a circumstance where the wife, sends, right, the wife sends an agent, so let's say the wife, let's assume that the wife is living in Atlantis and the husband is living, right, and the husband is, is living in, in um, Jerusalem. So the wife sends her agent from Atlantis to Jerusalem, and the agent comes back and he is holding a document, which looks like a divorce, walks like a divorce, talks like a divorce, <laughs> um, and he says to the woman, <coughs> you were divorced last month when I accepted this document. And then the husband shows up um, and says, what's he talking about? I gave him the divorce to hold. I never intended to deliver it. So now, right, now nothing, right, we don't, now the, the problem is the, right, the woman is not currently in possession of the document. The agent is still holding the document. So really now it's just the agent's word against the husband. Right, the agent says he gave it to me as a divorce. The husband says, "No, I gave it to you as a, I gave it to you as a safe deposit box." Right, so you can put it in a safe deposit box. Who do we believe? So the problem is, right here we have here we're stuck. If we believe the agent, so it might be that he's not telling the truth, and so what we have is a false positive. She believes she's divorced. We're going to believe the agent. We're going to believe that she's really divorced, but she's not. Because the husband just gave it to him to hold. On the other hand, if we believe the husband, it might be this woman really is divorced, and, we, right, and we're telling her she's not. So the Talmud records that Amore, right, a machluk, a machluk memoraim, this is sort of before, as to whom, as to whom we believe, uh, right, whether, uh, right, whether we, Rav Huna says that we believe the husband, and Rav Chista says that we believe the, uh, we believe the agent. Meaning, that Rav Huna says that we are concerned <coughs> about false positives. We don't want to create Mamze Ruth. We don't want her to marry somebody, somebody else when she's really married. So we, right, so we take the chance that right, we're, we're willing to deal with the, the possibility that we're going to treat her as married when she's not. Because the consequences the other way are, are, are too bad. And that's probably the less interesting position. Right, as far as he could say, you know what? So we'll make, make him write another divorce. Right? He figures the solution is solvable. Now, this is the interesting position. This says we believe the agents. And we allow her to remarry. But why? Why should we believe the agent more than the husband? Aren't we nervous that there are going to be some kind of tricks where the woman hires somebody to pretend, oh, I'll hold that get for you, <laughs> and, then, um, and then show up? 
So some of the Rishonim give a fascinating explanation of why Rav Shrista says this. The Talmud actually, the Talmud says the reason we believe the agent, so the words it says in Aramaic is the himne, because the husband believed the agent. So what does that mean? So the, the easy, uninteresting explanation of this is that, well, you know what? The husband, um, the husband, the husband obviously trusted him a little bit because he gave it to him to hold. So it's cheating to say, well, okay, I trusted him, but I was mistaken. He's really lying. You said you trusted him, so now we'll trust him also. That's the uninteresting explanation. There is, however, a much more radically interesting explanation which shows up in some combination of Tosfot and the Ron. What they say is as follows. When the husband gives the document to the agent, the husband is aware of the possibility that the, well, he doesn't know it's the agent. The husband gives, that, husband gives a document, right, we have, let's say we have um, Frank, right, Frank is the husband, and he, right, and, he, and, he hands it, and he hands his document to Paul. He doesn't know whether Paul's an agent, he doesn't, but the moment he gives the document to Paul, he is aware that Paul could now run to Atlantis, give the document to the wife, and if, and if Paul succeeds in doing that before he protests, then everyone agrees that, that the woman will be divorced because the ironclad rule in halakha is that a woman who comes into possession of a, bill, right, of a bill of divorce that she can demonstrate is valid, that is always enough proof. So once he wrote a valid get, and he gives it into anybody's hands, he is giving that person the, pot, the, right, the, the power to create a false positive. Right? Anyone who holds the, anyone who holds a valid divorce for some, right, for a woman in their hands, can create a circumstance in which we will believe that that woman is actually divorced. Okay, why does that get us anywhere? Ah. So now, Joseph pulls a very clever move. They say, is, and we know that no husband would be evil enough to, right, to, right, to wish his wife or ex-wife to believe that she's divorced when she isn't. That would cause her to be committing adultery and her children to be on Nobody would be that evil. Therefore, any right, therefore, any time a husband gives the document into somebody else's hands, he knows that he's giving the that person power, and he implicitly says, therefore, that what my intent is, whatever my intent is, whatever you decide. And therefore, the reason that Rechista believes that Rechista believes the agent in that case is not because the agent is telling the truth. We have no reason whatsoever to believe the agent is telling the truth. <laughs> it's because the husband gave the agent the power, and we know that whatever the agent says becomes the truth. Because the husband, in, right, because the husband would not have created a circumstance in which the agent could tell a lie. So since the husband, right, so whatever it is that the agent says, that's what turns out to be the husband's intent. Okay, so that I think is probably the most radical um, example we have so far, where what the rabbis say is, well, they're living apart, so they ought to be, right, so they ought to be divorced. We want to allow the possibility of divorce. In order to allow the possibility of divorce, we have to allow agency. The existence of agency is going to create circumstances in which there isn't any, right, you're going to create circumstances where we cannot directly know what the truth is. And they find a remarkable way of saying, okay, we can't know what the truth is, but we can, deter we can make the truth be what we want it to be. And then I think, I think it's a remarkable mechanism. Yes, did you have a question? No? Somebody, I thought somebody had a question. No. Okay, right, so that's where we are. We are so far is um, we've seen um, we've seen a bunch of models in which the rabbis are uh, which the rabbis construct the law in ways that make exceptions to the normal rules so that they can get the results they need. I'm not talking about right, they're not dishonest. <coughs> all of these right, all of these qualities are intellectually legitimate, but they're not default settings. The default setting is you require two witnesses. 
The default setting is that when witnesses contradict each other, you're left in a circumstance of doubt. What we have is at least in each of these circumstance positions where the rabbis say, you know what, we believe one witness, um, we believe one witness implicitly, we believe one witness, and we, and we believe that one witness even against the husband, even though that should normally be a circumstance of contradictory testimony. Okay. Um, so with that, let's move on to a set of um, more radical exercises of the power of divorce. Um, these are not going to be directly on point of the question of <coughs> false positives, false negatives, false negatives. Some of them we'll talk about unfortunate negatives. But at the end, we'll bring them all back together to this um, the main theme. Okay, so here we are. Um, where we are is a source number five. Um, so source number five, that, uh, what matters to us is at the end, uh, at the end of the, at the end of a long, of a long, of a long conversation, they tell a story about a woman who is just about to get married to one man, and somebody else jumps in and marries her first, carries her away, um, and then apparently regrets this. Um, I've seen it as one of these uh, soap opera, soap, right, soap, um, soap, op, uh, soap opera scenes. Is a case where she was married as she was married as a um, she was married as a child, and then okay, let's assume that the let's assume let's assume that the moral right here, which is what the Talmud assumes, the moral right here is that she should she should marry the guy she was betrothed to as a kid, and the other person did something wrong by jumping in. And she's not saying that she wants to make, that she wants to maintain it that way. So the Talmud says we don't require a divorce from we don't require a divorce from the second guy. She can marry the first guy as if the second guy never happened. Now, why is that? There was no biblical marriage for the first guy. The second guy came in and did what looks like a perfectly valid halachic kedushin. So why shouldn't we require again? So one answer is that we didn't understand the circumstances properly, and she really was married to the first guy. But the second answer is, you know what? He did something wrong. We don't like rec we don't recognize marriages that are wrong. So we right, so we annul the marriage. Now how we do that is a challenging thing. So we write, so the, the neat way is we retrospectively confiscate the coin which or the ring which he used to marry. Them which he used to marry the woman. That's, right. That's the neat way of doing that. Only works, of course, if you're marrying using money, but if you're actually marrying by, um, by, cons by, um, by consummating marriage, that's harder. However it is, right? obviously, a, um, a, uh, obviously some, kind, some kind of imagination is necessary here. Um, and the rabbis end up saying, you know what, that marriage doesn't work because he acted improperly, or he acted, he broke the rules, so we break the rules. Okay, second case, uh, source, uh, source number six. Um, so what happens here, right here we're dealing with um, shotgun, shotgun marriages, um, really literally, which is um, some sort of interesting, interesting halakha, um, which is what happens if I force you to sell something to me? And I don't force you, I don't force, I don't force you to, um, I don't, I don't force you to, uh, to, 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 um, to give me something, but I walk into a store and I say, how much, right, I walk to a jeweler store and I say, how much for that ring? And the jeweler says, it's not for sale, it was my great, great, great grandmother's been handed it in, it's always been my lucky charm, and he says, but how much is it worth? Oh, it's worth $50. So he points a gun at him and says, here's $50, give me the ring. So he paid fair value. But he paid, but the sale took place under duress. And so the Talmud's description of this is tell you who vizavit, which is literally pretty much we gave him a wedgie, and he sold it, and he sold it. Right, they hung him, they hung him up on a hook, and he uh, and he sold and he sold it. So there are positions which um, probably end up being the the halacha that such a that in such a circumstance the sale is valid, and a moral wrong was committed, uh, even a legal wrong was committed. But the legal wrong is not sufficient to invalidate, to invalidate the transaction. But in the end, the Talmud says, while there is a dispute about other types of transfers, 
everyone agrees that marriage doesn't work that way. Right? If somebody agrees to marry somebody else under duress, right, they genuinely consent. But they consent because um, somebody because somebody says, I'm going to leave you in an awfully uncomfortable position until you consent. So in that case, the, in that case, the Talmud says everybody agrees that the marriage is invalid and you don't need to get. And the answer again is, why is that? The answer is because we don't like recognizing marriages like that, so we retroactively confiscate the coin, um, etc. Okay. Third case. Um, well, right, yes. I mean, the issue of intent doesn't enter in here because if the people involved don't intend to marry by being forced to. No, they do intend. That's the point. Well, She's not lying. Right? We're not talking about a case of where somebody, where somebody lies. I really agree. But I agreed under duress. There are, right, there are times where you don't agree, and there are times when you agree under duress. Also, all of us make decisions in life under duress. But it's not about, it's not about, um, you can't, if, if, I, if I swore to something under duress, mm -hmm. it's not a valid, um, it's not a valid vow. That's probably true, that, that, right, that, vows, that, that doesn't work for vows, but let's assume it works for commercial transactions, right? That's the premise here. That if I gave you a fair value, now we have an interesting analysis. What would the equivalent be of fair value in the case of marriage? Right? right that's an interesting question. But that means you, you generally commit to the ketubah and all sorts of things, right? So theoretically, you could make an argument that this is another example of a transaction that takes place under duress, but where at the end of it, each party ends up with right with something roughly with something roughly equivalent. This gets into the question of whether right what happened. What about love? So that love doesn't enter into that equation. It's not a, right, it's not a commercially cognizable um, phenomenon. We can talk about that more next week, um, about the extent to which, um, on a formal legal level, emotional, right, um, emotional satisfaction is, um, takes, takes cognizance. So I would talk about next week, let's suppose if somebody claims I made a mekaf ta'ud because I was under the impression that I loved him, but I don't. So that normally doesn't work in the same way as, right, as if you say that, uh, right, that I bought that last week because I thought it was pretty, but it's not. Right? So what? You knew everything about it. Right? You just made a mistake in evaluation. Okay, so in that circumstance, uh, also the rabbis end up annulling it. So we have one other circumstance, which is um, source number seven, where the rabbis do something um, really even, more radically, even in their own... Uh, which is just in their own um, context, which is that what happens if you write a um, if you write a document in contemplation of death? So, uh, so, right, so under ordinary circumstances, you don't have to follow the nor all the normal rules of contracts if you write a contract in contemplation of death. But um, right, and by the same token, what happens if you write a get in contemplation? You write a get in contemplation of death. Um, so the question is then, what happens if you right, you write it in contemplation of imminent death, but it turns out because you think you're dying, but you're not. And then you recover. Can you change your mind? So in terms of commercial transactions, generally the answer is yes. If you write a doc, if you write a document, if you write a document transferring possessions because you believe you're going to die momentarily, and then it turns out that you wake up a few minutes later and you say, it turns out, whoops, you know, no, I wasn't deathly, I wasn't deathly ill at all. It was a misdiagnosis. So you can undo your you can undo your um, your, de your declaration. But I always say that's not true in the case of a divorce. The divorce is val the divorce is valid anyway. And as Helen explains, the, the fear is that if we say that the divorce is invalid, that people will that what's going to happen? So I wrote a divorce, and now my wife now I got up, so my wife is still married to me, and then I die, and now she's unmarried. But people will have the strange belief that the reason she's not married is because we were divorced after my death. And that's when the divorce became effective. It's a very strange conception of how people will think, but that's the way the Talmud sets it up formally. And the Talmud says in order to avoid that mistake, once again, we undo, right, we utilize this power to nullify the marriage retros um, retroactively. Which I'm going to take as a very simple statement, right? There's a lot of controversy about what nullification means. Uh, as I've told some of you, right, I spent this past Monday at the Tikva Jofa Abunah Summit in New York, and we spent... Lots of time talking about exactly how this works and 
why it is or is not applicable, but for tonight, we're just going to treat it as if it really means that the wedding is retroactively annulled. That's the simplest way of understanding it. Okay. What interests us is one of, right, and that, that's where we move now to source, um, to source number eight, um, is, a, um, is a case where this occurs along the axis of divorce on the issue that we are um, interested in, which is, what ha now we've allowed agency. Okay, so let's suppose everything was done properly. The husband gets up and the husband declares, I intend to write, I intend to write this document for the sake for the, for the sake of for the sake of divorce, for the sake of divorcing this wife, right, this wife from me. Um, and everyone writes the document exactly perfectly, and we appoint the agent with absolute perfection, and we send the agent off to right, off to Atlantis, and the agent arrives and hands the woman the divorce. Everything is great, except there's one thing we don't know. What happens if, while the agent was traveling, the husband called over a friend and said, you know what, I changed my mind. I no longer wish that man to be my agent. Or that woman. So this, right, this introduces a flaw in our whole system. Because now, a woman who receives a document from an agent can never know and can never prove that she's divorced. Because for all she knows, somewhere along the way, the husband, called, right, the husband, the, the husband the, was called Moser Moda'a, the husband made a declaration of intent, and now the agent's not his agent anymore. The document is fine. Everything the agent says is true, and nonetheless, right, every woman who receives a divorce by agent is at permanent risk of having that divorce question. Because she has no way of fighting the claim that the husband says that I annulled that agent before he reached you. Yes, sir. That seemed like the previous source when that you said where once he gives it over to the agent, the fund the agent stands would seem to contradict this. Aha, okay. So if we took once the he argument. Gives it to and sends away, he can't do anything according to the previous source. Well, so again, he can't do anything if the agent successfully gets it gets it into her hands. So the question is, what happens if he has evidence that he gets? Interesting question. It might be that according to the Ron, there should be. It's an interesting question I have to think about. Figure out how to, right, how to integrate, how to integrate thought, it. I thought you said it was different depending on who the agent it was. Um, we talked about, but either way, that was talking about a case where it's the wife's agent. Right? But what Mark is saying is that the principle of the matter should be that once the husband gives it over to anybody, right, that should. So and even in that it. case, it's only. Even in that case, it's only true um, if the agent, it's, it only would become true if the agent could give it to her. Still, it's a good question. So relax. I'm not going to give a good answer now. That's a good question. Now you guys can all figure out the answer later. That's excellent. That's an excellent question. Let's bracket it for now. I don't have, I don't have a good answer. Um, I'm pretty sure it doesn't work. Pardon? I'm pretty sure it doesn't work. I'm pretty sure it doesn't work, but I don't, right? yeah. but I don't, I don't have a good answer now, so I don't want to give a wrong answer. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, so there is one position um, which we, there's a dispute whether we follow this halakhically or not, but one of the tenetic positions, the position of Rabbi Shem and Leo, is that um, in such a case we annul the marriage. And we say that, and we say that, um, we have, right, even though by the normal forms of law, in fact, the divorce should not be valid, but we declare this divorce valid because you just can't, because that would undermine the whole nature of divorce as we understand it. The whole purpose of the law of divorce is that the document should be sufficient proof. So without using the really fancy mechanism of saying the husband gave him the power, we just say much more straightforwardly, we give ourselves the power. Okay, and I think again, right, if, you look at, if you look at that circumstance, that circumstance is the, right, is the, the reason that the rabbis utilize the power in that case is because they're not willing to allow that loophole in the system. Right? The whole purpose of, all the way through is to make sure that the receipt of the document is sufficient to prove divorce and that we don't allow the fact that the receipt has to be sufficient to say, okay, so that we can't have divorce in those circumstances because it wouldn't be proof. We always make the divorce possible and make the div and make the document sufficient proof. Yes, um, Are you using the words annul the marriage and divorce equivalent? No. Okay. We make the we annul the marriage. That means it never took place in the first place. So I guess I'm bracket for the purposes of this evening. I'm going to say that means as if the 
that means that the marriage never took place. But in practice, it's not anywhere near that simple. Um, right? Because, it, right, let's say the really fancy version is, what we say is, that we would annul the marriage. The husband, the, hu the husband is aware that we would annul the marriage. <coughs> and if we annul the marriage, that would retrospectively make all the marital acts that he committed in the interim to be sinful. And he doesn't want to be sinful, so therefore he undoes his own, his own nullification of the agent, because he knows that it wouldn't be effective anyway. All that he could possibly accomplish is to make his own, right, is to make his own action sinful, so actually, uh, right, so actually he doesn't annul the agent. And now the marriage did take place and is just a valid divorce. Okay, right, that's just one, one of the ways in which we can, one of the ways in which we can, in which we can accomplish this. Did you follow that? I follow it, because... Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Would it help if I told you that Malvin really loved this? <laughs> <laughs> if he was a rational actor, he wouldn't have done the, you know, uh, called back till she left to begin with. Well, of course, once we know it, right? So, right, so we, right, once we had set up the system, so nobody, right, so nobody educated would try it. Right? And it might be we could then argue, therefore, anybody who claims they tried it is lying because we know <laughs> right, we <laughs> they don't even have to resort to any of this because right? obviously he didn't intend it. Um, the only thing is, there's one case which I uh, which we should talk about is that there there are circumstances in which um, some people have argued, and there are at least some cases which it has been true, which we set this up deliberately. Uh, famously, there was one case in Israel, um, and, there's, and there's a similar case that actually happened in um, happened in Boston several years ago, where you had children of a second marriage which took place under circumstances which everybody agreed were innocent. Right, a, wife, right, a, wife, a wife remarried, she had no reason to believe, to, believe she, to believe that she was still married, but it turned out she was still married, and therefore the, her kids in the second marriage of Mama Zerim. So some people have suggested, in at least some famous cases it was done, what you do under those circumstances is have the husband appoint an agent, send the agent to the wife, and then annul the agent outside his then annul the agent uh, outside his presence so that you can annul the marriage so that the second marriage so the second marriage is no longer adulterous so that the children are not on there. Right, so, right, so that would be a rational circumstance to engage in. Uh, okay, that sometimes, that happened with famously in Israel in the cases of Holocaust survivors. Um, it doesn't usually happen as an exclusive thing, but I'd say it happened in our... There's another way in which you can do that, which is... Um, since the woman acquired, one of the ways in which the woman can be divorced is by is acquiring the document, and the question is, there's a dispute under certain circumstances. If you throw the document in her general direction, has she acquired it or not? And there are you can create a circumstance in which, by throwing the document at her, you put, you put her in a circumstance in which she can't prove whether she's divorced or not. And there, in those cases, we annul the marriage, because again, we can't allow the husband to create such a circumstance. So I was, it happened in, in our Beit Din some years ago, uh, where the representative of the Rabbanut came, and they had a circumstance where a woman had, remar where, where a woman had, uh, had remarried innocently, as a case, I think, where she had been married in, in, married in Russia, or as in a dis whatever it may be, if she didn't think she needed to get. She remarried, her kids, right, so the kids from her second marriage were now on Zerim, and, the, and we came and we had the woman stand in Boston Common, stand in Boston Common, and we... And, right, and, and we, as the husband's agents, deliberately created that circumstance in which she would not be able to prove whether she had acquired the divorce or not, and therefore the marriage was annulled, and therefore the second marriage uh, right, wasn't adulterous, and no one's zero. Now, they wouldn't have done that. that they did that only in a case where probably the first marriage wasn't valid anyway. <laughs> right, so they only did it as, a, as an addition, but, so, you know, but they, did, they did do that. It was really kind of cool. Um... <coughs> Okay, but what I want to, what I hope this um, right shows really is that the rabbis would never allow a, right, one of the premises of the system is that you cannot allow a situation in which the husband could deliberately um, leave the wife unsure whether she is divorced or not. Any loophole in the system which allows the husband to create that circumstance <coughs> we close by whatever means. Uh, and we also don't allow, right, and we close it even though we have an alternative solution, which is just not to allow divorce in those circumstances. But we don't. We insist that there has to be possible for there to be divorce, and that whenever, it's, whenever there is divorce, it has to be possible for the result of that divorce to be that the woman can demonstrate. 
Okay, the last case, and then with that we'll close, is that there, um, right, so now we're reading um, source number nine. Um, so in <coughs> source nine, we discover that, um, we discover that um, uh, certain sacrifices have to take place willingly, lirt so no, and so the Gemara so Yavamot says, he must sacrifice it, right? So certain, at certain times, these sacrifices are um, the sacrifice, but if he took an oath, right? So now you have to bring the sacrifice. So we coerce it. And he must sacrifice it. On the other hand, it says willingly. So if we coerce it, how can he be willing? So the answer is, well, we coerce him until he's willing. <laughs> right? This is the inverse of the hanging the guy up, right? right? Hanging, the, hanging, the, hanging the guy up, um, or, right, or just hanging the woman up until she says yes. So in this case, we hang the man up, or the, well, the woman up, whoever, whoever made the pledge to give the sacrifice, we hang them up until they say yes. Okay, and then they say, and you know what? The same thing is true.